Soon, Grandfather leaves. Your elder brother, Stefan, goes with him. From that day on, Father's hired teachers tend to you alone. They bore you with monotonous lectures on writing, counting, and the way of life in the Blessed Arknean Empire. You often distract yourself from the instruction by place, or playing with your younger brother, Nathan. Your home grows quiet without your elder brother. Too quiet. Weeks later, your family receives a letter from Stefan. Grandfather has sent him to a boarding school for nobles, and he is now studying hard in preparation for his service as a nobleman. The rules here are way too strict. You can't even sneeze without the teacher's permission. What I've been studying with my peers, we're, we're learning how to live as nobles in a noble society. We're also learning the art of swordplay. That's my favorite part. With Stefan now at the boarding school, Grandfather arrives once more, this time to live in your house. The only good thing is that he often has urgent business in Eterna, the capital of the Empire, and has to travel there. One day, you ask Mother where he lived before. In Eterna, she says. But now his place is here. Each time Grandfather returns, he gives the servants new orders. Your home is now always busy with repairs. The servants are redecorating Grandfather's chambers, including his library and sitting room. Sometimes Father tries to gently talk him out of this. Why subject the house to constant reconstruction? Grandfather's answer is always the same. This home is mine, and I will live here as befits a man of the nobility. <coughs> Some days, Grandfather stays home, and on those days, you try your best to stay out of his sight. But there's no way you can avoid family breakfast. The food is there, but you cannot bring yourself to eat it. Mother's eyes are red and swollen. She's been crying all night again. Grandfather sits at the head of the table, where nobody used to sit before. Robert, it is time me that your youngest sons underwent their sacraments. Sir Brandt, please, let them live free of the lodge for a while longer. They are but- SHUT YOUR MOUTH! Robert, that wife of yours is impertinent enough to interrupt me! If this ever happens again, she'll be eating gruel with the servants in the kitchen, where she belongs! It is time you consider a real marriage, Robert. One to a woman of the proper station. Gloria drops her fork. Grandfather shoots her a scathing look. A tear rolls down Mother's cheek. Father does not look away from the plates. His hands clenched into fists. Baroness Eldar is one such woman. She is a comely widow and a fine match. She is suing for her inheritance right now, and could use proper support and a husband. You can keep your lowborn lady around if you like. Servant mistress, I don't care. I will not do that, father. I am the head of this family, and the family's standing took a severe blow after you are married, that commoner. It is unthinkable how, how could you give up? The memory of beautiful Amalia Lelborn for this lonely woman and that bastard child of hers. But now, you have a chance to set things right. Don't disappoint me. Father nods curtly, trying not to look in Mother's direction. Father, I wish to see Stefan. If I find your conduct in the Baroness's presence satisfactory enough, then you may see him. She is coming for a visit tomorrow. Be prepared. Grandfather wipes his mouth with his napkin, throws it onto his plate, and leaves Mother's lips. And leaves. Mother's lips move silently. Nobody says a word. Then Father stands up and orders you and the other children back to your rooms. He needs to speak to Mother in private. Father comes to your room before bedtime. He sits on the edge of the bed and adjusts a crease on the woolen blanket. He distanced himself from you after Stefan's departure, so you're not used to such attention from him. In the candlelight, you can see his face in the dark. There's a sour expression on it. My son, Baroness Emma El Ladar will be visiting us tomorrow. Please, be polite and treat her with respect. Nathan will do as you do. 
I want this dinner to be as immaculate as possible. Don't let me down. On the next day, Mother starts dressing you and Nathan for the coming dinner. You see red all around her eyes. She's been crying, and for a long time. It hurts just to look at her. Nathan starts whining, whining quietly. You and Nathan are dressed in new doublets, your tussled hair brushed into shape. Gloria is told to stay in her room. Father appears wearing his best suit. Mother is in a humble brown dress, looking pale. Grandfather has an uncharacteristically contented look about him. You hear the sound of the wheels and hooves against the cobbles in the yard. Then a pair of dainty heels come clacking. The antechamber is completely quiet, and still fearing Grandfather's observant eye. The door opens. You see your guest, a beautiful dark-haired woman in a dress of elegant deep blue. Father takes the hand of Lady Eldar and kisses it, showing her in compliments. Grandfather's face is beaming in her presence. No one even bothers to introduce Mother. Baroness. Allow me to introduce you, Robert's sons, Brian and Nathan Bronze. Frankly, it's his eldest son, Stefan, who deserves the most attention, but currently he is studying in Eterno with other young noblemen like himself. It is my hope that his younger sons will also make me proud someday. Grandfather eyes you with a probing, a probing look. How will you act in front of the Baroness? Will you accept her here next to your mother, your father's rightful wife? We may greet the Baroness politely, gain some reputation, lose some unity. Uh, Mom's not gonna like it, but uh, Robert and Gregor will appreciate it, so that's something. Uh, walk away with Mother, lose some reputation, gain some perception, though. And, uh, you know, kind of inverse relations is the other thing. Maintain your composure. All that happens here is you, you lose willpower. That doesn't seem great. Demand that mother be introduced. Unity would go up and reputation would go down. And Gregor would dislike me. Reputation or unity? Yeah, we're just a child here and we're not even like eight years old. What are we, like six or seven? We don't need to be running and setting the agenda here. We'll greet the Baroness with the utmost politeness. You follow Father's example and kiss the Baroness's fingers gently. Her laughter fills the antechamber, ringing like chimes. You gallantly offer to lead her to the sitting room. Lady Elador graciously agrees. Behind your back, you can hear Mother sobbing. Grandfather and Baroness Elador Engage in small talk over dinner. She tells him of the woes of litigation over her late husband's inheritance, and he advises her like the judge he is. Father is mostly silent, only getting in a word or two. You do your absolute best to behave yourself. After the decorous farewells to Lady Elador, Father quietly thanks you for your muddle behavior. The morning after he leaves for Eterna with Grandfather to visit Stefan, Mother spends almost an entire day in her bedroom. You cannot bring yourself to speak to her. Father returns from the capital in a quiet rage. You overhear your parents talking. Apparently, Grandfather has already poisoned Stefan's mind against him, and he greeted Father with cold hostility. The name of Baroness Eldar is never mentioned in the house again. And Mother is indifferent towards me. Ain't that wonderful? That's, uh, Roberts liking me more. Gregor is completely indifferent, neutral. That's, that's progress. Reputation's gone up, but we still do have disagreements here. But, I mean, what family doesn't, right? Hmm. The Kaleidoscope. Father now checks on your studies often. And nitpicks you for sitting or eating or speaking in an incorrect fashion. Once he becomes so annoyed, he says that he wishes Stefan had been the one to stay home instead of you. He never expected to hear these words from your father, of all people. Grandfather's trip to the capital took longer than expected. 
It feels lighter around the house without his presence. You allow yourself a little change of scenery. Instead of your room, you now busy yourself with reading and calculations in the sitting room across from the open door to the yard. Gloria has joined you today. She's already helped you progress through several complex passages in the book. Right now, she seems preoccupied with a strange tube. Aren't you hurt by the way Grandfather treats you, you ask? Gloria shrugs. Grandfather always says that they should get rid of me. <laughs> I'm used to it by now. He hurts you a lot more because you're closer to him. I just have to stay out of his way. That's it. She shows you the strange tube she has been holding all day. Look at it. It's a kaleidoscope. I got it as a gift. Want to see inside? Excited by the idea, you close the book and peer into the tiny hole on one end of the tube. Your eyes see a multitude of intricate patterns. Each turn of the tube reveals a new web of interwoven colors. They mesmerize you. The kaleidoscope turns the fire, burning in the fireplace, into a cavalry made of flames. You're riding at the front of the fire horsemen, ready to face the enemy. Grandfather's face emerges from the intersecting lines, and you swing the kaleidoscope like a sword, cutting it in half. Now you look at the blue sky through the window. The patterns are unending, secretive, and calm and peaceful. Just like Father's smile before Grandfather's invasion. The deep blue gives way to a scattering of gold radiating gentle warmth like mother's arms. This fleeting beauty, too, soon gives way to a hypnotic new pattern. Again and again you see your family in these interconnecting figures as they come together and break apart. And in the middle of this golden glow, you see Gloria's green eyes gazing at you observantly. Your sister left you long ago. The books are abandoned and time slips away unchecked but you are still busy peering into the kaleidoscope. Order emerges from the chaos before you, before your eyes again and again, but you cannot preserve it, no matter how you try. You are caught in an inner conflict. There's so much that can be done with this kaleidoscope. Should you take it apart? Or ask Glory how it works? Or keep enjoying the patterns it shows you? But you still have the lessons to do today. We can take the kaleidoscope apart, more perception at the cost of willpower. Keep looking through the kaleidoscope. Even more willpower. Or, return to your studies. Lose a bit of willpower, uh, but gain a determination. I'd say gaining some determination seems pretty alright right now. And we already have a, quite a bit of willpower, so I think this is fine. You put the kaleidoscope away and return to studying the book. There's so much you have to discuss with Gloria. You cannot help but wonder what things did she see there. But first, your lessons. When Father walks in, he sees you hard at work over the book. He chuckles in approval, then spots the kaleidoscope on the table next to you. He puts the toy to his eye, then freezes, still for a moment. It takes him an effort to put it back down. Then he praises you for being diligent and leaves. When today's section of the book is finished, you take the toy upstairs to your sister's room and tell her what you saw in it. Gloria smiles, knowing what you felt. I once saw a ballroom full of dancers. I watched it for an entire hour. My hands even got sore. You spend a long time with your sister, discussing the kaleidoscopic figures, and you feel a strong connection to her. The toy has brought you closer together, made you interconnected, just like the lines and figures in its colorful eye. Still full of power, and we're active in terms of determination. Sweet Temptation. Grandfather's visits are no longer a cause for fear and panic in the house. He has become something you are used to, something nagging yet not unordinary, like a splinter or a stain on your trousers. The tension still remains, however. Sir Gregor's disdain for everyone in the house is so palpable it almost stings for real. Your lessons with the tutor are done for today. You're walking down the stairs when you spot Gloria peeping into the sitting room through a slightly open door. You sneak up on your sister and tap her lightly on the shoulder. She's startled. Oh, it's you, Brian. Uh, look, Sir Gregor eating something. Grandfather is sitting on the sofa, flipping through a book with one hand and reaching for a glass bowl with another, now and then. Inside the bowl, you see candied fruits. A sweet confectionery forbidden to the common estate, like all sweet things. 
Yet Grandfather's face shows no pleasure as he keeps consuming the highborn treats. The clock strikes three. Grandfather rises from his seat, puts away the bowl on a shelf, and leaves for the yard. He always takes a walk in the city at the set time. Gloria nudges you with her elbow and looks at the candy bowl when you look at her. The first emotion you feel is fear, but next comes curiosity, and it is stronger. Stefan used to boast that candied fruit tasted incredible, and now you have a perfect opportunity to try it. You try candied fruit first. The sugar, the sugar starts to melt as soon as you put it on your tongue. It's so sweet. You've never eaten anything as good as this. You take the whole bowl off the shelf and give it to your sister. She takes a fruit and brings it to her mouth. Carefully, like a rare treasure. There's a thumping on the stairs. Footsteps accompanied by the knocking of a walking stick. You have no idea why, but Grandfather is back. You quickly hide behind the sofa and pull Gloria after you. But she is frozen in place with the bowl in her hands. The door opens. Grandfather's menacing figure advances on Gloria. His hand seizes her arm. You squalid, ungrateful, lowborn child. How dare you bite the hand that feeds you? You and your trollop, trollop of a mother would be sleeping in a ditch if it were for my spineless son. The sweet and pleasant things in life are for the noble estate, not for the likes of you. Did you forget your lot? His hand swings and hits Gloria on the cheek. She falls to the floor right next to where you are hidden. Her fingers glisten with the warm, melted sugar that brought you here. Grandfather advances again, his walking stick ready. But then he sees you huddling behind the armchair. Please don't hurt him, Sir Rand. This is all my fault. He, he tried to stop me. You can already see a bruise on Gloria's cheek. This is only the beginning of her punishment. Gloria was caught red-handed, unlike you. You can still avoid your punishments. What is it then, milk soap? Did you try the sugar too? Or are you trying to stop this piece of, piece of filth like Chase says? Okay, can tell the truth? Gain some perception, lose some willpower? Lie? Gain some willpower? Or mock grandfather? Can't actually do that, because Gloria ain't grateful to us. Hmm. And I would love to mock him, but I can't. So... I mean, Grandfather's scary, so I think this is a lie situation. You stand up and start talking. Yes, Gloria was telling the truth. You were trying to stop her. Grandfather tilts his head as he keeps you transfixed by his inhospitably bitter gaze. Then why did you hide the armchair? Behind the armchair like a petty thief. It was all Gloria you tell him. She told you, Tide. Gloria looks at you with pain and disappointment when you say this. Grandfather nods, satisfied by your answer. He tells you to stay and watch him punish Gloria. For the first time in your life, you see somebody else being punished. Her skin split apart by Grandfather's walking stick, her clothes getting soaked in blood as she writhes in agony. Night comes, but Gloria's sobbing keeps you awake. You go to her bedroom and try to calm her down, but a muffled go away is her only reaction. She lied to Grandfather for you. So why is she angry with you now? Okay, so Gloria doesn't particularly like me. My family hates me, sheesh. Mother takes Gloria to church next morning. They return late in the afternoon and Gloria begs Father on her knees for forgiveness. She will never ever take what she does not deserve by birth, she pleads. She does not look at you. Not even once. Full of power, though. Got that willpower. That's something. The Sacraments. Father and mother have been focused on Nathan and you since early morning. Instead of breakfast, you are told to say your prayers, wash your hands and faces, and get dressed in plain white shirts. Today is the day of your sacraments. Mother, I want to go play in the yard. No playing today. You and Brian are big boys now. It's time for you both to have your first sacraments. No one can live without a lot. I don't want a lot! Be quiet and listen. 
You were born commoners, so you must accept a lowborn lot before the twins. When you grow up, you will get a chance to earn a noble lot. Father and mother take you to the carriage. Nathan is hungry. He starts whining. Grandfather is the last to get in the carriage. His eyes are on you and your brother, looking for every fault. Soon, the carriage is moving along the streets of Anazote, slowly and solemnly. One more turn, and you see a colossal white building marked by two massive pillars. For the first time in your life, you are to enter the Church of the Twin Gods. You enter the gate and walk under the splendorous dome of the church. The church hall is divided into two halves. They are drastically different from one another. The floor on one side is rough and jagged, and covered in dried brown spots, while the floor on the other is made of smooth marble. The commoners kneel on the jagged floor, and the well-dressed nobles and their families sit on the pews. Father and grandfather leave you to sit on one of the nobles' pews. Mother walks to the rough stone on the commoner's side, and gets down on her knees. You see her wince in pain, for the lowborn estate shall suffer in the house of the faith. The church, the church acolytes surround you and lead you to the altar, where you and the other children will take your sacraments this day. Before you stands a tall priest dressed in black, with a sword in one hand and a hefty whip in the other. Nathan's whining grows louder. He dislikes this place. He's scared. You remain quiet, but your stomach roils in uneasy anticipation. The first child to take the sacrament is a jaunty little boy from a family of nobles. The priest extends the sword before him and recites the words of his lot. From this day forth he will fight and rule and pursue the arts and minds, now forever free from the throes of suffering, for he now belongs to the noble lot. The boy proudly touches the flat of the blade with his lips. Nathan is next to receive the sacraments. He suddenly snaps out of his fearful trance and tries to break free, but the acolyte pulls him toward the altar and throws him on the jagged floor of, on the lowborn side. The sharp edges bite into Nathan's knees as he lands, spraying drops of red around him. I don't wanna! Brian! Why do they wanna whip me? What did I do? You try to break free and run to Nathan's side. You want to give him courage and protect him, but the acolyte's grip on you is too firm. You feel utterly helpless. Your little brother has to face the world all by himself. The priest starts reciting the words of the lot as he swings the lash over Nathan's shoulders. From this day forth, Nathan, thou shalt endure and work and suffer. Thou shalt be ardent in thy labor and humble in obedience to thy rulers. And now cometh thy first true suffering, which thou must accept with gratitude. The lash cracks. It strikes his right shoulder. It strikes his left shoulder. The blows are so powerful that Nathan falls to the floor. The priest tells him to rise. He has received his lot. Nathan gets on his feet and drags himself toward Mother, his knees torn and bloodied, his spirit broken. It is your turn. Your feet will not move. You can barely muster enough strength to walk to the altar. You get down on your knees and feel the sharp stones below. So sharp your clothing cannot protect you. Your skin begins to burn. The acolyte forces your head down, and you feel the lash being drawn above your head, ready to strike. The priest's words are for you now. This is thy sacrament. Thou shalt work and endure and suffer. Thou art about to receive thy first true suffering by the sacred lash. Dost thou accept thy lot? I could accept it, lose the determination, gain a perception. Could raise your head. Uh, no, well, I can't. I don't actually have enough determination for that. Gives willpower. Catch the lash. Gain a determination, lose a perception. Or kiss the sword. Uh, this would take ten willpower. Uh, lose a perception, but gain a determination. And you get uh, a destiny, a nobleman's sacrament. And uh, Gregor Brandt would like me a bit more. We can go for a kiss of the sword, that sounds fun. Let's fight our fates! I, I don't care if I'm a commoner, I'm gonna be a nobleman! I'm just gonna kiss that sword! The whip slices through the air, about to strike, but your eyes are transfixed by the blade the priest holds in his other hand. 
You jump up and away. The lash misses you. You grab the blade with your hands. It cuts into them without mercy. The priest re wrenches it away from your bloodied fingers. You look him straight in the eye. I am Brian of House Brant! The priest freezes in shock. You seize this moment to pull the sword closer and kiss the smooth, cold blade. You hear cries of outrage among the churchgoers. Mother prostrates herself on the jagged floor, racked with fear. Father remains still, baffled by what you have just done. But Grandfather looks at you intently, as though truly seeing you for the first time. There's a semblance of respect in his gaze. You're forced back to the commoner's place at the altar. The acolytes seize you by the arms and legs and keep your face bent closely to the bloody, jagged stones on the f of the floor. The lash strikes your right shoulder, then your left shoulder. Then you are told to rise. You are a commoner. Mother takes your hand and leads you out of the church. Once you are outside, she scolds you for being insubordinate and bringing shame to your family. Nathan holds your hands as you walk, his tearful face a mixture of confusion and awe as he looks into your eyes. But you do not feel as though you have made a mistake. You did what was right for you. Alright, Gregor likes me a bit more. Got some determination. Uh, lost some perception, lost some willpower, but you know, it's fine. I'm still ready for action. The Sacrament, Year 1125. You have taken your first sacrament and received the commoner's lots. Nobleman's Sacraments, Eventus Apples. You challenged the Sacred Order and attempted to seize a noble lot. Unsuccessfully, but you know, it's the thought that counts. The mark left on you by the sacrament takes a long, long time to heal. Mother says it is a reminder of your lot, suffering and sufferance, pain and patience. Gloria shows you the mark of the lash on her shoulder. One day, it will never disappear. You are a commoner now. This is the lot you were born into, but Father keeps telling you to study hard so you may yet earn a different lot and become a noble of the mantle. You recall the past with warm sadness, when Stefan still lived with you, or when he wrote to you for a time shortly after he left. Now he thinks it beneath him to write to commoners and his family. Mother didn't lock herself in the bedroom as often back then. This changed shortly before Nathan was born. But most importantly, you missed the time before the terrifying figure of your grandfather was constantly looming over you. You learned the true power of the lot only after the head of the family's arrival. In Grandfather's eyes, no commoner deserves to be treated with kindness. Is this just him, or is it the way of the entire world? The very thought makes you queasy. You're older now, and what's more, you are an elder brother now. You've learned how to care about someone else, how to teach and protect. Soon, you are a small boy no longer. As the days pass, play gradually gives way to laborious study. Now your choices will decide your place in the bizarre and ruthless world of adulthood. Your childhood years are over. Alright, that's chapter one, childhood done. Had some events here. Pretty cool events, I guess. We ended up with four determination, five perception, so pretty balanced, honestly. Uh, five willpower, ready for action, uh, no deaths, and we can continue.